Hello, my fellow investors, and welcome back to another earnings report slash stock analysis video. And, well, guys, today we're going to cover... Oh, boy. Today we're going to cover the company Tesla. They just had earnings. So, by the time you guys are seeing this, it'll be, you know, a day later. But I figured, you know what? Since this is such a great company and every single time I do it on the channel, I get so many lovely comments from so many lovely and smart people. I decided that, that you know what? I want to bring in my co-host slash the technical analysis partner here on the channel. Mike, introduce yourself. Hey everyone, so I'm the technical analysis person on the channel, so I basically do a lot of the technical analysis. That's kind of my suited version of analyzing the market and just kind of giving you a different perspective on the market, but also kind of guiding you guys in that realm. So I kind of just wanted to bring you along for this Tesla video because, I mean, this is quite possibly the most polarizing company that we could do right now on the channel. And, and I mean, you've done it too. And you have gotten a lot of interesting comments, to say the least, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's, the thing is, like, t like I say, you, the chart's gonna tell you what it's gonna do. If yeah. you don't like it, guess what? You can go get donate your money to the S and P five hundred. So we are, yeah. So we are going to do the fundamental analysis, and then after that, we're going to see what price we should be paying for Tesla or the the company. I mean, and then we're gonna take a look at the technical analysis with you, Mike. Okay. All right. So with that said, let's get started with this analysis. So let us start off, guys, with their earnings. Now, this was just posted a couple hours ago, like two hours ago. As so if we're recording this, it is 6.36 p.m., so, you know, two and a half hours ago. Not updated yet on Seeking Alpha. EPS normalized estimate, they were expecting 85 cents. EPS gap estimate, 74 cents. Revenue estimate, $23.36 billion. And you can see that... Uh, uh, up until this uh, earnings that came out, there were 12 revisions down to the downside. Now, Mike, do you know what their earnings actually came in as? I actually don't. You actually don't. Great. So, um, unfortunately, this is not updated, but take a look at this. Tesla non-gap EPS of $0.85 cents in line. So, okay, their EPS non-gap uh, was in line as they were expecting. However, the revenue of $23.3 billion misses by $60 million, which... If you guys have seen, not, what's up? It's not like, you know, everyone knows my opinion of EPS is the most fudged number in history. So I never, but the 60 million, I've seen companies where they miss by worse and it's a not a more. huge. And now you are talking about a growth company. So they're not necessarily the, you don't want to see revenue miss on them. Not only just a growth company, but quite possibly the growth company, right? I mean, aside from like AMD, I don't think that there is another company out there like Tesla has, right? Like when it comes to just popularity, right? So Agreed. that revenue miss was absolutely massive. Now, I always say in regards to the earnings, you know, a miss is a miss because of analysts say, you know what, we think that this number should be this. Does that mean that the company isn't growing? Not necessarily, right? Because if they're growing year over year, yet, you know, they, they just miss on one quarter. Because remember, this is only one quarter. It doesn't really make a dent on anything. So let's actually move into the earnings report when it comes to Tesla. Now, their earnings report is a little bit weird because they have it in like almost like, like a PowerPoint kind of thing. I'm not really a fan of it. But we got over here, profitability, 11.4% operating margin in Q1. $2.7 billion gap operating income in Q1, $2.5 billion gap net income in Q1, and $2.9 billion is non-gap net income in Q1. Operating cash flow. So this is now, guys, the biggest thing when it comes to Tesla is that we need positive cash flow. We just desperately need positive cash flow. And when we take a look at the graphs, you're going to see that the cash flow within the past couple of years, well, with the past five years has not always been positive, but it actually has been increasing. But we can see here that the free cash flow is actually just in Q1 alone, 0.4 billion dollars. That's not too shabby, right? That's not too shabby. Most companies don't even make, most companies don't even make a million dollars, you know, um, in Q1 alone. 
So the fact that they did 0.4 billion, that's not too bad in Q1, right, Mike? What do you say? Yes, but also they're not valued. Other companies are not valued at the market cap that Tesla is. Which we are going to see that, which we're definitely going to see it because, you know, this is just one thing over here, though. It's, it's good that they are, you know, 0.4 billion dollars in Q1 in free cash flow. But again, what is the value of that $0.4 billion? Is it valued correctly at the current moment? That's the hard part that people just don't tend to understand. So we're going to cover that when we get into the calculator. We got over here operations. We got Cybertruck factory tooling on track, producing alpha versions. So I'm guessing they're producing more of the Cybertruck, the alpha version now. Okay. Model Y was the best selling vehicle in Europe in Q1. Okay. Model Y was the best selling vehicle in the United States Q1. X, X pickups? I don't really know what that's supposed to mean. So that's pretty interesting to say the least. Now we go over here, the summary. In the current macroeconomic environment, we see this year as a unique opportunity for Tesla, as many car makers are working through challenges with the, un with the unit economics of their EV programs. We aim to leverage our position as cost leader. We are focused on rapidly growing production, investment in autonomy, and vehicle software, and remaining on track with our growth investment. So just that paragraph alone, what do, you, what do you say with that? Personally, I see it as we're basically trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel by cost because you can cost yourself out of business or cost reduce, not cost reduce, you can dr price drop yourself out of business. The only reason that price drops work is to basically completely consume the market share on the sector per se. Mm -hmm. But you can't necessarily do that to companies that are way bigger than you from a asset standpoint because honestly to subsume like the big three gm ford or chrysler uh, you're gonna take as well. a lot of uh, freaking time to wear down their assets that they can sell they can downsize you can't necessarily downsize because you're just take flooding. market share take market share you mean yeah yeah and, On top and of those companies have big smaller smaller market caps yep the larger market shares right i i absolutely ag agree with that and also the fact that people always make the th the the statement tesla is more than just a car company no tesla's a car company the fact that right over here their operations their main three ones is relating to cars guys Tesla is a car company. Sure, do they have, you know, vehicle software? Do they have their solar panels? Sure. By the end of the day, majority of their cash flows is coming from cars. So let's continue to read on with this. Our near-term pricing strategy considers a long-term view on vehicle profitability given by potential lifetime value of Tesla vehicles through autonomy, supercharging, connectivity, and services. We expect that our product pricing will continue to evolve upwards or downwards depending on a number of factors. That's such a nothing... <laughs> that's such a nothing that's paragraph. Such a lawyer speak. Yeah, that's literally that's such a this is a nothing paragraph. Although we implemented price reductions on many vehicle models across regions. By the way, yeah, apparently in Q1 they did lower the price of a bunch of cars. Huh? They did what? it again recently. The, yeah, that's what that's referring to. That's what that's refer or, or what do you mean by by recently just like last week, like in Q2? Yeah, in Q2. They did it again. Yep. So they, so not only did they undercut their competitors, they are almost like, in my opinion, undercutting themselves because if this is reflective of the impact cost reductions have mm -hmm. on your earnings, mm -hmm. I don't want to think of when you're leveraging higher debt now on top of operating expenses that you cite in your earnings and you're going to be making less money on those cars. Well, unless your volume goes through the roof, you're well, not going to make that back up. Well, let's face it. A Tesla car is worth a lot more before the reductions, right? Tesla cars were worth a lot more. Weren't they worth like 60 grand or something like that? Like it was a lot more. You were the, it depends which model you're working at and what features it had. If you had this, I know if you loaded it with the self-driving features, and if you got like a higher end model, you were up into the 50s and 60s. But right now, the Model 3, if you're probably around the third or one of the lower base models, you're around the 30s or right. 20s. OK, so taking that from, let's just say the 60 gram part, that is that's a truck, right? That's the cost of like a Toyota truck or like a Ford truck. So 
the fact that the car was worth the price of a truck, that is ridiculous. So maybe they're cutting costs just to be more competitive and maybe the, maybe they are cutting costs in order to, to be to say something along the lines of like, you know what? Uh, if we cut costs by, let's say like half, right? So from 60 grand to 30 grand. Well, if that essentially quadruples our, our sales, well, that pretty much keeps it at net zero, right? Well, I like to use this analogy. Yes. And I've also worked at my work with these salespeople. Okay. And they are all the same. They give you this hypothetical situation. Mm -hmm. They don't live in the world where reality and theory are two different things. And theory and reality are two different things. They never come true unless you have some groundbreaking technology that everyone just needs. Like, do you, the fundamental question is, do you need a Tesla? No. Can you, can, can you function without a Tesla? You, you can, you can function without a new car. Let's just keep it real. Okay. So, so, okay, taking that assumption, right? How are you going by reducing your margin on units sold, mm -hmm. going to compensate for that loss by selling more vehicles? And on top of that, and on top of that, let's stick with that same analogy. If you don't need a Tesla, you don't even need a new car. Uh, and then add on top of that, the current economic environment with high inflation, why would you buy a new car? And also referencing how hard to pay the bills are for everyday Americans. Why would you want a car that the second I charge it and it gets a little cold outside, 50% of my charge goes away. So I basically lost 50% of what I put into the car. That's a really, really good point. All right. So let's actually keep on reading this. So they did uh, have a bunch of price reductions in the first quarter. Our operating margins reduced at manageable rate. We expect ongoing cost reductions of our vehicles. So they're gonna continue to do this, including improved production efficiency at our newest factories and lower logistics costs, and remain focused on operating leverage as we scale. We're rapidly growing energy storage production capacity of our mega factory in Lathrop. I don't really know where that is. And we recently announced a new mega factory in Shanghai, China. We are also continuing to execute on our product roadmap, including Cybertruck, our next generation vehicle platform, autonomy, and other AI enabled products. Our balance sheet and net income enables us to continue to make these capital expenditures in line with our future growth. In this environment, we believe it makes sense to push forward to ensure a lay proper foundation for the best possible future. So they're, they're telling us a bunch of stuff here. And in my personal opinion, I don't necessarily know how this is going to affect it because now they have thrown in a, a wrench into their whole entire system of making money into making revenues that I have no idea how this is going to impact their future revenues. So that's a big, big yeah, red flag, I guess you could say, right? Because like, mark. or question mark, right? Question mark makes more sense. So let's actually delve into now their financial summary. And you don't tend to look at these, right? Nope. Okay, so here we go. We got total automotive revenues. We got over, so this is in millions, okay? So this is in, in millions, except for the percentages and per share data. So anything like, you know, earnings per share kind of thing. So we got over here, total automotive revenues. Q1 2023, $19.96 billion. That is insane. Because here's the part that a bunch of people, well, here's the part I always bring up to people when they say Tesla's more than just a car company. We got energy generation and storage revenue, 1.53 billion, and services and other revenues, 1.8 billion. Which one of these makes the majority of the money? The automotive revenue. The automotive. Therefore, Tesla is a car company. End of story. And in fact, take a look at this. Total revenues as of 2023 Q1, 23.3 billion dollars. Now we did see this in the earnings that we just saw. However, look at this. In comparison to Q1 of 2022, 18.756. That is a pretty big increase in my personal opinion, though it is a drop from Q4 of 2022 to Q1 of 2023 by around a billion dollars or so. Nonetheless, though, I don't technically like to focus on quarter over quarter changes. I like year over year and this year over year, an increase of a little bit less than $3 billion. It's not too shabby in my personal opinion. What do you think? Well, it, you have to weigh it against what other growth companies are doing. So it's not too shabby in the perspective of a value company, but Tesla's not a value company. It's a growth company. So you have to weigh it against other growth companies. Well, it is growing. Don't get me wrong. It is, it is growing. 
the question is is um how are these new reductions in costs uh, for, you know, selling cars? Is How is that going to impact this? That's the main question. And again, that's the question right there, right? That's the main question that we got to ask ourselves. Nonetheless, though, let's move on to now net income attributable to common stockholders. We got $2.5 billion. And look at this, Q1 2022, $3.32 billion. That was a decrease of 24% year over year. Net income attributable to common stock shareholders non-GAAP. This was $2.9 billion. And again, in Q1 of 2022, it was $3.7 billion. That's another decrease of 22%. So you here's the thing. Like, we're getting a massive increase of 24% year over year for the revenues, yet their income is decreasing. So in the positive, really, really good, but a decrease of what, a billion dollars? That's not necessarily that good. Coming down now into the net cash and provided uh, operating activities, we got 2.5 billion and in 2022 Q1, it was almost $4 billion, another decrease of 37%. Capital expenditures, this is CapEx, right? We got $2.1 billion and in Q1 of 2022, uh, $1.76 billion. This is the negatives, this is a CapEx. So you can see that their CapEx increased 37%. So this is a problem over here because year over year, their cash from operations, which is this net cash provided by operating activities, this is decreasing. You do not want the cash from operations to be decreasing. So what happens is, uh, when it comes to the free cash flow, the free cash flow, it is just the cash from operations, less your capital expenditures. If the cash flow, it is decreasing, but the cash from operations increasing, but the capital expenditures is also increasing at a much higher rate, you could give the, the excuse, I guess you could say that, well, they're just taking more of that money and investing it back into themselves, right? To grow, you could say that. However, the problem arises when capital expenditures increases yet cash from operations decreases that's a problem because as you can see right here look at this free cash flow mike look at this free cash flow 441 million dollars million it dried up. right it dried up and again it wouldn't be so bad if it was just okay you know if the cash from operations went from like four billion dollars to like let's say 4.5 billion dollars right mm -hmm. if it was that and we still had uh, a free cash flow of 441 because the capital expenditures went up, you could say, you know what? At least maybe they're just reinvesting back into themselves, right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing because it's growth, right? Yep. But in this case, cash from operations is decreasing 37% year over year. CapEx is increasing 17% and the free cash flow just dropped 80% in one year. That's bad. That's that's really, really bad. So right then and there, that's going to cause a lot of major problems because again, every investment, guys, is the present value of all future cash flow. So with that said, all right, Mike, you ready to go into the discount of free cash flow? Oh boy. Oh boy, here we go. But before yeah. we actually get started with the discount of free cash flow, uh, what do you think about the Tesla car, Mike? It's okay. It's not. It's nothing to cry home about. But it's, I mean, it's you a have nice a car. You have a Corvette, though. But <laughs> that's yeah. yeah. I mean, look. I I think it's a cool looking car. I think it's um. I think it's. I think it's cool. Like I, I think electric cars are eventually going to take over. It's just that we're not at the point yet. But don't get me wrong. I think Teslas are by far the best out there when it comes to electric vehicles. In my personal I do opinion. find their autonomous driving very fascinating, especially how it's being applied in the industry yeah yeah so it, 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 it it's a good car i personally like it i think it's a cool looking car i think i you know i'm a fan of elon musk i love his trolliness um so with that said again guys we think tesla is actually a good car okay so what you're about to see from this moment onward hopefully y'all don't get triggered <laughs> So let's get started because every single time, you know what happens, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> like, every single time. So let's come now into the calculator. And unfortunately, this thing is being stupid. So let me just refresh this. And there we go. We got the ticker symbol for TSLA, a market cap of dear Lord. You want to read that market cap? $565 billion. 500, well, let's just say it, $566 billion, right? Let's just round up yeah. at this point. Guys, this PE of 49.87, I like to buy anything under 20. This is double, <laughs> more than double. 
This is more than double, which is absolutely insane. So even if you don't know anything about shares of standing, free cash flow, any about that, just looking at this PE alone, it should bring up a massive red flag just, just from the very beginning. And on top of that, take a look at this current share price of $180.59. Now, this share price has gone for a freaking roller coaster of a ride because, well, let's actually take a look at this graph now. On the one year, they are down 45% year to date. You want to read that? Up 67%. That's insane. Year to date, 67%. In fact, take a look at this. The, the beginning of this year, $108. This company got so low the beginning of the year, it almost broke $100. Like, it's absolutely insane. In fact, look at this 52-week range, $101.81 to $364.07. And I don't believe that was even the peak as well. Like the peak was as high as what? Four, $404. And this is even post stock split. It was like at $1,000 at one point, right? Uh, before the stock split. So yep. that, that is a massive, massive drop overall. And you know, you could pretty much just see, I don't know, Mike, tell me something about technical analysis. When, like just, just by looking at this uh, five-year graph right here from like this Basically. point on. What is it? Basically, down, you're downtrending with a broadening wedge. It's kind of bullish if you consider the broadening wedge. However, seeing the volume picking up around that 100, it kind of indicates maybe a volume capitulation rally that right. may or may have not completed. There are sometimes two legs to volume capitulation. You get the first leg, deck cap bounce. And here's the thing. Um, strong stocks don't go down after earnings. It's kind of... A very large thesis in the market. A strong stock will not be taken down by any earnings because no matter what, you will find buyers to buy it. So, with so, so, with that said, with that said, look at <laughs> this thing as a post market. Well, first of all, during the trading day, down 2.02% on the trading day and post market, 5.86%. $10.59? That's absolutely insane, guys. We just went from $180.59 at the end of the trading day to $170. That's insane. That kind of volatility. Oh, by the way, all because, all because it misses by $60 million in earnings. That is unpredictable. That is just ir irrational to no end. Because look at this. It just fluctuated again. 5.42% now. So this is just this this stock is just i don't even know what to say a roller coaster of emotions right yeah i mean at one point it was as low as 101 dollars at the 52 week low that's crazy so that is pretty much what this thing has been doing on the one year year today and the 52 week range coming back into the calculator they do not pay out the dividend which is you know it's fairly fairly understandable seeing that they are a growth company and if we take a look at the five-year average free cash flow they have 3.2 billion dollars in this metric and as of their last year's free cash flow it is 7.56 billion dollars so it's increasing it right because the last year is higher than the average that's pretty good to see so now with that said Let's head over now into the fundamentals, and I'm going to need your help with this one, Mike, because I want you to tell me what you think of what I should put for grades when it comes to these fundamentals. All right. So we're going to start off with the net income. We got five years ago of negative $976 million to one year ago of $12.56 billion. That is an increase of 1,386%. Thoughts? <laughs> That's just the net a... income alone. That's just the net income right now. Thoughts? So, for a growth company, that kind of is not going to say normal. It's pretty good and expansionary. But here's the thing. If you're having income, why aren't you able to continue gaining uh, uh, revenue and gaining expanding your market share well, we'll take a look we'll take a look at the we'll take a look at the revenue that's a separate graph my main concern when it comes to revenue or, or or sorry my main concern when it comes to the net income or just any profit metric graph it is take a look at this you went from negative 976 to negative 862 to a positive 721 all of that right there seems reasonable right nice consistent growth right Mm -hmm. Then from 721 million to 5.52 billion, billion with a B, 
Does that seem reasonable? Even no, if it's a growth and company. What, and well, what they could be doing is using debt to create that. Sure. And then how does that affect you now? Sure. And then on top of that, take a look at this. From 5.52 billion to 12.56 billion. More than double. Right? More than double. That right there, yep. this kind of jump right here and here and from here to here is not something I like. So what would you give this net income as a grade from like zero to 100%? 70 being passable, anything under 70 would be like fail, I guess you could say. So just based off of this. You would, you would think 80? Yep. Okay. So with me, I, I, I'm, I'm going to let you do this, right? I'm, I'm going to let you do okay. this. Uh, for, for me, I have actually would have given this like a 55. Because, really? yes, because here, here's the reason why. I don't know whether these two right here are, are outliers. For okay. all we know, right? Now, if, if the two-year goal value would have been something along the lines of like $1 billion, I would have mm -hmm. been like, okay. Or like you know, like even $1.5 billion. I'd be like, okay, understandable. But that kind of massive jump is not something I like. And then more than double from two to one year ago is not something I like again. Because again, you need to account for outliers. If you just take a look at one or two years and say, oh, it'll just next year, it'll be 15 billion. Well, what if next year ends up being 10 billion, right? Or negative. Or negative, right? Or, or, or even lower than this 5.5 billion. You don't know, right? Because it's outliers. Because the mean, the median right now, it is between these three, not these two. So mm -hmm. if this comes down to like a billion dollars after this massive $12.56 billion, it's going to be a massive, massive just headwind for everybody. So that's why I would consider this as, as a 55, but you said 80, so I'm going to put 80%. Looking now at the free cash flow, we got, this one looks a little bit better in my personal opinion. We got five years ago of negative 221 million to one year ago of 7.56 billion now free cash flow as i said it is the cash from operations less your capital expenditures but what have we been seeing with the capital expenditures as well as the cash from operations in this past quarter basically going down it's going down right massively i mean if we take a look back at this cash cash flow right over here down 80 percent on the year on the year so from q1 of 2022 to q1 of 2023 down 80 percent that's a pretty big red flag now does that mean that this year they won't beat not necessarily right i mean one quarter doesn't mean much but it's the start of a warning flag. it's the start of something right it's, 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 it's the start of a warning but what would you give this as a gray i mean negative 221 to positive 7.56 billion that is an increase of 3521 percent with an average of 3.2 billion dollars so what would you give this as a grade seeing this graph right over here it does look a lot better than this though right correct but yeah it's more uh, linear so the only reason i wouldn't give this a higher grade is because of that warning flag so i was gonna say 75. okay 75 percent yep that, that that works that works do you want to change your grade up here for the net income by the way uh let's go down to 65. 65 all right 65 percent 65 percent so free cash flow not looking too bad uh, there really isn't any major outliers, I guess you could say, except for like three to two and then from two to one, pretty much what we just saw here as well. But it's not as prominent as you just saw with the net income. So yep. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I would say like 75, maybe 70% as well. Looking now at the revenue. This one is by far the best looking one. We got five years ago of $21.46 billion to one year ago of $81.46 billion, increase of almost 280%. You can see a pretty pretty consistent increase from five to three years ago and then the massive spike of a, an increase of 20 billion dollars from three to two years ago and then an increase of 30 by actually a little less than 30 billion dollars from two to one year ago this is what i'm talking about outliers right so yep. what, what would you give this as a grade it does look a lot better though than even you know the free cash flow and the net income so what would you give this as a as a grade 60 because i'm considering the okay. future economy basically in that okay. grade to basically show a shrinkage okay okay sounds good sounds good looking now at the total assets minus the total liabilities pretty much in this one guys we're seeing that it, 
at least they've never been in the negatives. And by the way, I have seen companies that this is in the negatives, and that's really concerning. But once again, you could see that it's fairly consistently increasing from five to four, and then the massive spike from four to three, and then another massive spike from three to two, and then another massive spike from three to, from two to one. And so far, we have not got gotten this updated yet, but. You know, it is what it is. Average total assets, it is $62.65 billion. Average liabilities, it is $31.62 billion. Doing this difference, we get $31 billion, guys. What would you give this as a grade, Mike? 80, just because it has 80? them. It, it's not, it has enough assets to cover its liabilities. That, that's, that's actually 100% true. And on top of that, they've never been negative as well. So it is yeah. what it is. Now, the next metric it is the... <laughs> cash flow minus, minus the liabilities basically we take this free cash flow up here right we take this free cash flow and again remember it it is increasing right it's mm -hmm. increasing and we take only the liabilities and then we subtract the cash flow minus the liabilities to get this number interesting isn't it <laughs> very very interesting because remember free cash flow is used to pretty much do everything It's used to pay out the dividend make acquisitions grow the company buy back shares and pay down debts i.e the liabilities so the cash flow minus the liabilities pretty much just tells us how good is your cash flow able to cover their debts right if they choose to actually buy all of it back if they, if they choose to pay down all of their debts how mm -hmm. good how much money in the free cash flow would they have left after doing that and um yeah you can see just the downtrend graph you know they 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 increased this a little bit from three years ago to two years ago going from negative 25.76 billion to negative 25.56 billion but as of one year ago they brought it even lower in fact last year was the lowest point at negative 28.88 billion dollars which is a lot lower than that of the average at negative 25.82 billion dollars so what would you give this as a grade probably a 40 a 40 Okay. Just because Reasons. the right now companies, in my opinion, should be paying off debts because it is fundamentally more valuable to pay that debt off than roll into a higher interest environment. Mm -hmm. If your cash flow is shrinking, you're basically stabbing yourself twice. You're shrinking cash flow, and you're not, and your expenditures are going up on top of now you're paying those debts. So it just all compounds to one another. Also, remember something as well. This is not taking this quarter's free cash flow, okay? This is taking yeah. one year ago. So this is 2022's free cash flow, just FYI. So yeah. looking at 2022's free cash flow, you can see that it is very much consistently increasing. Yet even with that consistent increase in the free cash flow, this thing's still going down, meaning that they're taking on a lot more debt than they are increasing their free cash flow, which is really, really concerning to see. So, all right, 40%. And now for the silent killer, the one that nobody ever figures out. Um, and it's really, really sad because people just don't tend to look at this. This is a silent killer because the, the more a company issues shares, the more they are diluting you as the investor, right? Because all that the current share price is, it is the market cap divided by these shares outstanding. You could have a company of a market cap of a million dollars with one share. What's the share price? Million. A million dollars. Now, if you have 100 shares and the market cap is the same, what is the share price? I'd be like 100,000. Did the value of the company change? No. Exactly. So all that you're doing by issuing more shares is you are splitting that free cash flow amongst more and more people, which is not good if you own the shares. So looking at this, this is a massive, massive dilution on the five year going from 2.6 billion shares five years ago to... 3.16 billion shares increase of 22.21 percent on the five year and from the previous to the current year we're looking at two years ago of 3.1 billion to 3.16 billion as an increase of 2.1 percent and on top of that never not even one time did they buy it back even a little bit so what would you give this as a grade 20 because you're diluting my value on top of a company going you know what down i would give it value. you know what i would give it well, a zero. <laughs> a zero. A zero. Like, they haven't been buying back. They haven't even kept it the same. The reason why this one year ago value and this current value is the same is because it hasn't been updated yet. But that's the now, only thing. Elon thing. did say, and you know, I uh, take this with a pound of salt, that he, they weren't going to go issue any more shares. However, we have to see if that actually came true in their filings. Right. I mean, I, I like it when people say, yeah, but they're doing this. Yeah, but they're going to do that. Yeah, but they're going to do that. Okay. 
how about we wait until they actually do it and then we go back to take a look at this right because i i, I, I can't be, be basing stuff off of things that may or may not happen right so i'm looking at the raw numbers what has happened so i'm you know what what would you give this let's say a five because i want to give elon a little bit of a chance to redeem right. himself this all year. right all right all right a five percent and lastly looking at the cash and equivalents this is just basically how much cash they have on hand they currently hold 16.25 billion dollars with an average of 13.24 billion dollars so now let's come into the overall grade we gave them the income a 65 percent free cash flow 75 percent revenue 60 percent Assets minus liabilities, 80%. Cash flow minus liabilities, 40%. And the shares outstanding of 5%. Overall grade of 57%. I'm basically, by the way, boys, since I know you you never seen this, I'm basically putting more emphasis on the free cash flow instead of the net income and the revenue because free cash flow it is everything. Every investment is the present value of all future cash flow. So 57%, it's a fail. I consider 70 passing, like barely passing. 57%, it's a fail. Where do you see the main problems here? Uh, mainly, it's going to be the cash flow to liabilities on top of the revenue and net income basically shrinking. That's going so, to be your three so, biggest killers. So I would actually argue, you're, you're right when it comes to the cash flow, but I would actually argue it mainly has to do with more of the liability side than the cash flow for starters. Also, the shares outstanding, massive, massive dilution, 20% on the five year, right? So if they were to just fix their liabilities and continue, hopefully continue the free cash flow the way that it's going, you know, the liabilities, this metric over here would essentially solve itself. The net income, the main problem that I have with it, it is the spikes, really just those two spikes. But if they continue to grow it at that rate, then this would obviously be higher at a much later point in time. That's just my personal opinion about it. So now let's come into the discounted free cash flow part. So before we actually get started, let's come back to this. Uh, let's come back to the Model Y. Really cool car, right, right Mike? R really cool sure. car. Sure. Really cool car. really cool car, right? Elon Musk, best troll. Love it, right? 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Awesome. So with that said, guys, here we go. Now, I'm going to have you pretty much do all the assumptions when it comes to the revenue as well as the predicted short buyback. But Take a look at this, everybody. Okay, not inputting anything, just keeping the required rate of return at 10%, meaning year over year, you want minimum 10% out of this company. The target share price, not adjusting for debt, it is $15.80. And then adjusting for debt, it goes up. I'll give them that. They have a lot more cash and equivalents than they do net debt, which is really, really good. Um, it's still $36.75. The current share price is $180. So right there is essentially where people are going to be like, no, you're wrong. There's no way that it would fall that much. I, I can't wait for uh, the part we go over the chart and they tell me uh, ch uh, chart astrology is for men. I mean, look, I, <laughs> I'm just saying... Even even if you guys don't like the whole chart stuff, which by the way, I'm not a fan of technical analysis. I don't understand it. But when the charts, when technical analysis is telling you roughly the same thing as to this alone, guys, I mean, there has to be something there, right? There just has to be something there. The more things point in the same direction, I mean, it keep, it keep pushing that water up the hill until that water falls back down. All right, so. Obviously, the second we put in some revenue growth numbers and predict to share buyback, this is going to go up or down. So we, we don't really know as to what we're going to put in for the revenue. So let us use Seeking Office Growth tab. And we can see that they're estimating a forward revenue of 35.41%. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. I personally don't believe that. But I'm going to leave this up to your discretion. Of course, please use this as a, as a reference, Mike. So revenue growth year over year has been 5135 the forward is expected to be 35.41, but also remember that the revenue here on their earnings report year over year, the total revenues has been an increase of 24%. Okay. Mm -hmm. So use all of that knowledge to now tell me some percentages for the revenue growth. Lowest assumption. What do you think the lowest revenue that they'll do in the next five years? 10%. How much? 10%. 10%. Okay. And then the median assumption? I'm going to go with 18%. 18? Yep. Okay, 18. And the highest assumption? 25. 25. Okay. And now for the predicted share buyback. They have been... Zero. 
Well, okay, hang on a minute. So you can go negative, right? You you can actually uh, go negative issuing, because negative sure. means issuing. Uh, so for a low assumption, let's assume a 5% issuance. So negative five, okay. And then medium will go put Now remember, zero. hang on, let me stop you, let me stop you. This is in the next five years. So let's, oh. let me show you, yeah, this is the cumulative of five years. So in the past five years, today, they have issued 22.21% of shares, okay? So all I'm saying is in the next five years, what is going to be the cumulative uh, projected shares buyback or um, issuings? So that's essentially okay. it, yeah. So I'm gonna say, I would like to change it to 30%. <laughs> okay, negative 30%, okay. Yeah, negative 30, uh, negative 20, and negative 10. Negative 20 and negative 10 for the highest assumption. And uh, with that, we get the target share prices of $16.78 to $32.48, not adjusting for debt. And then adjusting for debt, $37.41 to $69.61, with a margin of safety of 5, 10, and 15%. This puts me between $31.80 to $66.13. <laughs> Every single time I do, I do this, company it always lands me at around like this this exact thing every single time it i could put i could change these things to whatever i want and i still get around like 50 bucks for the media you can't change history you can't change the historical trends that you're basing it off of that that's the simple fact history kind of shows what's going to happen in the future and again uh you know uh, past returns doesn't mean future returns it's not guaranteed but you have to use past values you have to use past you know shares outstanding you have to use what they've done in the past so that way you can make predictions conservative pr predictions in the future people have mentioned in the comments you can't how could you possibly take a look at past metrics to take a look at into the future i'm like that's literally what you're supposed to do <laughs> that's literally what you're supposed to do and here's the thing also people who say oh this thing will never fall down to 50 um the, what were you saying at 400? Right. What in the world were you saying at 364, which is, by the way, a year ago? 364 was the, the April 20th of 2022. 325, actually. It was even higher. Yeah, right there. 342. Whatever. Within the 52 week, this thing was high as $364. And all-time highs was all the way up to 400. So if you guys don't believe that this thing can fall to you know sub 100 or even 50 bucks i mean you just went from 404 to a low of 101 let that sink in okay 404 to 101 that is a difference of 300 plus dollars so the fact that it can't fall from 180 to 50 I mean, it has already fallen that margin already in the past year. Not, not even that long ago. You already wiped out 54% of someone's value buying at the top. So there you go. Now, like I always say in every single video, guys, these are just my assumptions, right? Every investment is the present value of all future cash flow, and it's not financial advice. So please have these calculators, make your own assumptions, because you guys just saw me input all of these numbers. And um, let's just say that you believe Tesla's revenue will be, I don't know, 50% and they'll start buying back shares at a whopping rate of like, I don't know, 35% in the next five years. Well, um, adjusting for debt, now you can actually justify this current price of $180.59. The current share price at that point would be $214.56. Is that probable though? No. Not, <laughs> not if it's possible, because anything is possible, right? Well, where here here's the question that you have to ask yourself where are they going to get the money to buy back the shares and two where are they going to get the money or the margins after cutting prices on their cars to generate that revenue growth well well uh, a company can gain revenue by issuing shares like this that's, but you're that's in the, the way conundrum of buying back shares. Right. Yeah. Then you're in the, in the conundrum of projected shares increasing and then you're further diluting investors. That's the and problem. you're wiping out whatever growth you had. And that's the problem. So, again, you guys can pretty much put whatever numbers you want over here. But in my personal opinion, I like to be conservative. I like to think about the probability of stuff happening, not the possibility. So, I personally think that these numbers are fair enough for me. And unfortunately, you know... I would personally start buying Tesla 
at around like 50, 50 bucks, maybe $70, maybe 80. I don't, I don't mind paying a premium of like, you know, 10 bucks or so. But at the current share price of 180, guys, that's massive. That's absolutely insane. And again, to those people who say it'll never fall there, I mean, just take a look at the past year and a half. It went from 404 to a low of 101. So it absolutely can fall to that. It just depends as to, you know, what needs to happen to actually fall to that. Because at the end of the day, fundamentals drag prices up or prices down. If you want to justify this market cap of 565.8 billion dollars, you're going to need a lot more cash flow and a lot more net income and a lot more share buyback. So unfortunately, the current price is not a buy. Maybe later it might be a buy because again, I actually do like Tesla. Mike, you like Tesla too, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, it's a car company. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty decent car company, but not at the current price. It's not yeah. worth it. It just isn't worth it. So I think that'll pretty much do it for the fundamental side. Mike, I'm going to leave it to you now to take a look at the graphs. So guys, we're going to jump over to the chart side. Similar to how we talked about last investors meeting before Tesla basically broke this ascending trend line or the symmetrical wedge and broke down to its 200 weekly. We got a similar story here. We're breaking down in post market this symmetrical triangle that price targets basically we're going to be conservative with the price target going to the center of the wedge not necessarily to the outskirts breaking here will project us down to the 120 dollars now there has been these gaps on tesla sitting at the 154 mark all the way to the 144 mark so this gap has not gotten filled for a very long time. If we start coming down here, it would be an easy gap fill. Read a discovery of prices and you actually got several gaps. You got one here that's uh, around the $135 region. You got another one in this area of 124 to 120. And these could not necessarily be gaps, but they're minus development areas where price didn't spend a lot of time. You don't have a lot of price action. In you don't have area. consolidation as well, right? You don't have yeah, you don't have consolidation over there there's, either. There's okay. little to no volume recently transacted at that price. Whereas if you look here, you basically have a very nice conjunction of volume. That'd be a strong base for you. However, with what I would perceive as bad news for Tesla, however, we have to see how the market perceives it, a close below, and I'm going to be conservative with, I'm going to say $170, on tomorrow the close because you know you can open below the wedge it you need a full body close below it to basically confirm the break i don't like when they gap down below and then push up it's just my own personal opinion i don't like trading stocks that way because you're basically just hoping for the best case scenario you're not actually like if a strong stock like i mentioned before is a strong stock it won't go there it will basically hit a brick wall when it gets to this price and not go below it. You're below the 200 weekly. Net. So more and more bearish intonations here. You tried to get above the 50 daily. You got rejected off of it. Now you're heading lower. So where, where is the fit? Where is the, where is that by the way? Where's the, 50, so you had the daily? big red line right here. So you got rejected off of it. Around oh, I see. Wednesday okay. Okay. I see of last week. And basically you're heading possibly lower and got you. If we go out to the larger time frames, you have a inverted head and shoulders here that is forming. However, when you start trading above below the neckline of $164 or $165, you're invalidating that pattern. And due to the consolidation that you're having here, I would also say this pattern is invalidated and you're probably heading lower. I know that's not what everyone wants to hear about Tesla. They just want to hear baby go to the moon. But the charts that's are basically... What, that, that's an understatement. <laughs> basically, here's the thing. You consolidate around this 200 weekly for such a long period of time, which is this yellow line. You basically, one, you broke below it. You, you found support, right? So, you know, maybe just a fake out. You pushed up, got formed a trend line, rejected down to it again. Now you're testing it today for the third time. It's like... How many times can you test the dang support before you just say, it I'm breaks. giving up? Yeah. Yeah, be before Usually the dam breaks. Times. One, two, three, breaks. You know, four times, breaks. So now everyone knows I love harmonic patterns. Where could Tesla be going from here? Well, the simplest harmonic pattern that if it completes, it's going to be pretty brutal for Tesla. Now, to confirm, you got to trade below $103 which would project you down to the $6.13 region for Tesla, 
which is absolutely brutal. I don't necessarily- Wait, 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 what? Yep. So if you- Say that again? Say that again. Just say that again. So the I harmonic didn't... pattern- didn't say that, yeah. This your A to B, B to C leg. Yeah, yeah. Projects down to the three dollars and fourteen cents to six dollars. You know, depending where you take the peak. If I correct it to the peak right here, projects down to six dollars and thirteen cents for Tesla. Now, per share. Per share. Now, wow. Fair warning. Large harmonics necessarily don't always play out. I like to play the shorter term time frames. So if we take the shorter term time frame for Tesla which is inside this consolidation. What Got, would you consider short, shorter term? Uh, about a month or two, nothing nothing that spans okay. several, um, across a half a year or say, because this, this pattern, okay. that harmonic started in September of last year, so I really don't like using necessarily them, but it, it shows you things that are intonations on the chart. Got you, okay. So A to B, B to C off of this last push up, completes down at the $158 region, which once you come down here, in my opinion, you're coming for this gap fill, you're heading lower. On yeah. top of it, I'm just laying on the bad news here. So if you look at, if we look at a simple retracement of this move, companies usually like to retrace 50%, that projects you down to 159. So it's, everything's coming back to this gap fill down here. and. When things are projecting down to a gap fill, that's not necessarily where you want to be going if you're Tesla. You want to be going down to, if you want to come down to a 120 region, maybe form a double bottom here off your lows of the 100. Yeah. Th that, that may be bullish, but here's the thing. Why do I want to buy a company that's below all the moving averages now that I, I, I got back above my moving averages, right? Your, your key one, the you're 200. You're barely up though. You're, yeah, yeah, but you're barely up above them. Well, usually, like I always tell people, I'm like, when you get out of the 200 weekly, that's when you start buying back in. You buy on the moving average retests. But since you consolidate into this region for such a long period of time, you, your consolidation started January of this year. January uh, 27, so and basically February, let's call it February, to now you've gone zero. You basically got nowhere. And so... So the moving averages is that red line and also the white line. I, th I think that's the white yes. line under the red line right there. Yeah. So they're so, di they're different ones. Uh, they're different lines. Okay. So they have different importance. Uh, the but, main but, one. But what I'm noticing is is that as of recently, only I think maybe one or two of those wicks have actually even touched the white one that's under the red one. Correct. I use the um, the 21, which is the basically like my bullish bearish indicator for it. So we're, I'm just actually going to take it out just in case, so we can clean up the chart a little bit. The you broke down below the 50 week, the 50 daily, which is basically like your short term bullish or bearish sentiment, and you're basically forming what could be like perceived as a bear flag on the intraday or daily here that gets you down into this $159 region. And we've now projected four patterns that are projecting down to this 158, 159 region. You know, you don't necessarily mean you're going down there, but you're going down there. And here's the thing, if investors got beaten up so much, so you have all these bulls that got beaten up right here, right? And they see Tesla going back down to 120. Are they gonna be, reluctant to buy again or are they going to get steamrolled i that's a that's a good question because i have i mean we have been seeing the buying the dip mentality nowadays so i i personally do not know the answer to that so well here's what a lot of people brought up if you go back in history whenever tesla had these big uh drops 20 30 percent drops they got immediately uh -huh. bought back up 20 30 percent drop immediately bought back up 40 percent drop immediately bought back up so when we were heading down here on this leg here, you weren't really seeing that. So, you know, like people were saying, buy the dip mentality. Yes, but here's the thing. You're not buying the dip now, or we really have to see uh, how we close today, basically to see if you close above that 175, 172 yep. region. If you do, yep. okay, you got the buy the dip mentality, but you gotta get above 176.93. 176 93 which very, is very your interesting because weekly. so the so 176 so it needs to end today so market needs to so post market needs to end and it needs to be at 176 
Correct. That's what you're basically... So right now, as of I'm looking at this, it is down 5.87%. Sub, it now, it just fell under $170. Yep. So, so you're fighting if what you're saying is region. true, then... Yeah, so if, you're, if, we're, if what you're saying is true, this will probably continue to go lower. Based on you breaking that pattern already, now the bulls have to step up. You know, if the bulls step up and they save this chart, Moral. sure. Yep. But let's let's just take a look at Lux Algo real quick, just to see if it tells us anything that you know we're missing. Now, I was looking at Tesla prior to earnings. This was a bullish sign that the MACD was pinching together. Can you to zoom in on that? Can you zoom in on that more? So here we go. So the MACD prior Thank to earnings. You. Thank was you. pinching, and I mean butt cheek squeezing together to the bullish side. <laughs> it, it didn't cross, you know, I always say you gotta wait for that cross, but you could have shown more bullish intonations to the signal. However, you know, don't use one indicator to base your whole entire thesis on. The charts basically was saying that volume was going towards the bearish side. You had a more uh, bearish squeeze, the volatility was low and the trend was pretty crappy to the downside and if we look at the weekly this is why i always preach go to larger time frames i went to the weekly and i was like oh the weekly crossed i want nothing to do with this company in a bullish sense this is telling me that the long-term price is going to be going lower we're going to be revisiting lows and we could be price targeting down to that 137 region all the way down to the 97 region where we had previous support. However, if we start breaking these lows of the hundreds, you know, because the week the weekly graph is gonna show and you're probably gonna be pummeling into that oversold territory on the RSI, mm -hmm. if Tesla comes back to retest that, to me, the death of Tesla, and I don't mean bankruptcy guys, just don't take that that way. I'm saying the waterfall initiation point or the possibility where people start to panic is when you start gap filling, when you start getting to the 155 region and you start going down to 144, the momentum, right. you don't have a lot of price action. Like you said, there's not a lot of consolidation. You could see volume capitulation round one, volume capitulation round two, that should be bigger than before. And that's when, similar to your calculator, I put these targets while we were talking, these 6961 to 3180, that definitely okay. be a region historically Look at how much price consolidation is in that region right here. There is and that, is that is across how many how many months? So that is two uh, almost a year of price consolidation. That's the 2020 wow. to mid 2020 market, but it show here's the thing. You have a price target, right? And you have yep. previous sideways action in it. So somewhere in the zone, probably the middle or even this pivot point of $55.82 would be a very interesting area to look to pick up Tesla just because it's previous price action. It's gonna be probably a monthly. If we look on the monthly chart, and this thing don't, if this chart cooperates with me. So if we look at it, it's basically where Tesla started its astronomical rip. In this right there, yeah, right there at that, at that exact same price point. So it's just <laughs> that's naturally, crazy. bro. That's so freaking crazy. Can you zoom in on that? Yeah. So it's Can basically it's where you had previous. Here's the other thing. You have that's, previous look at, large look at the, volume. Wait, 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 one, one, two, three, four, four engulfing candlesticks. Up, but like right before it just had that massive one right yeah. over there. It just skyrocketed after that. That's and crazy. Here, here's the most beautiful part about it. Uh, companies that go parabolic like this usually correct 70% of the way. So we go from here to there, 70% correction is where you were double bottoming at the 105 region. So right at the hundred, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So now if you break that, you're coming down to this level. Like th there's no, in my mind question, if you start breaking the hundreds on Tesla, mm -hmm. you're going to see mass, mass panic selling and everything. Is that going to happen the next month? I don't know. I don't think so. Just because stocks. Uh, to me, you would have to trigger the market crash scenario. You have to trigger a lot of different things. And for that, guys, you're going to have to wait for our weekend deep dive where we kind of go into a more deep analysis of that and kind of give you, we'll see the closing prices of the week and kind of give you yep. our own in-depth analysis. But for Tesla, you've had one, two cuts now. You have two cuts. You had the opportunity to go up. You failed to even get to any of the upper moving averages. 
if you're not going up, you can be going down. So now if Tesla closes above 173, 172 t today, great. Uh -huh. It could continue higher. If it don't look more bearish side, look for these gap fills and look for more downside sliding, especially with the earnings, in my opinion, weren't anything to go jump off a roof for, or it just, it wasn't exciting. It was I'm, flat. It's, I'm it not was excited flat. It was, it was in line. It was in line and the revenues barely, like they missed. Not by a lot, but they still missed. So, like, and the free what? cash, remember also, the free cash was also projecting it. Well, sorry, not even projecting it. The, the free cash flow is coming down by 80% on the year, which is massive. And yeah. not because capital expenditures is going up, it's because cash map rates is going down, which is even worse. Yeah, it, you question what is going to make an investor excited to buy Tesla. And I cannot come up. It ain't cash flows. Like. And if you guys and if you guys wouldn't mind, put it down in the comment section. Why are you excited to buy Tesla if you're excited to buy Tesla? Why or, or what and, is lacking? And, and at what price would you like to buy Tesla if you haven't bought it yet? So we're um, gonna wrap the video up here, guys. So if you have any comments, throw them down in the section below. We always like hearing what you guys have to think. Even if you are triggered by the video and wanna throw us a uh, mean comment down below we appreciate them too. we still love that too yeah but i think that would pretty much do it for this one guys like if you like comment subscribe it really does help over the algorithm on youtube again the best way that you guys can help us is by doing that you know we really do appreciate all the super comments that we get but again the best way that you guys can help us it is to like subscribe comment and of course word of mouth share if you do enjoy this kind of content i actually fairly enjoyed doing this like with you like at the same time fundamental and then um the the technical analysis maybe we should do this more often that down the line if you guys like it as well we'll we'll, we'll consider it anyways that will pretty much do it so with that said guys peace out and we'll see you all in the next stock uh, analysis video as well as any uh, technical analysis series